Greetings once again. I hope and trust I find you well. This is a continuation or a sequel from our previous discussion on the Consumer Protection Act or Consumer Law. And we have already established that the Consumer Protection Act seeks to balance the relations between the stronger supplier and the weaker consumer. As such, you will realize that it is more skewed towards the consumer than it is towards the supplier predominantly. Therefore, it is incumbent upon the business person to acquaint oneself with the demands and expectations of this particular law. And in this tutorial, we shall zoom in on these expectations of the supplier as compared to the customer's rights, as was the case in the preceding video. And section 21, that is where we begin, talks about delivery of goods or supply of services. Subsection 1 provides as follows. Unless expressly provided in an agreement, it is an implied condition of every transaction of supply of goods or services that A. The supplier is responsible for delivering the goods or performing services. Subparagraph so 1. On the agreed date and time, if any, within a reasonable time after concluding the transaction or agreement, or 2. At the agreed place, or three, at the cost of the supplier in case of delivery of goods, or B, goods to be delivered remain at the supplier's risk until the consumer has accepted delivery. So as we look at this provision in uh, section 21, we want to start with the responsibility to deliver goods. The responsibility to deliver goods. Now, it, it does not always follow that uh, delivery of goods would mean uh, the supplier will ferry goods to your place of residence or to the place of your operation. The delivery of goods would mean that, number one, the supplier is going to give you vacant possession of the goods, that this has always been the common law position. And the other thing that we must understand is that the delivery of goods would um, mean where the agreement is not specific on where the goods are going to be delivered. They are supposed ordinarily to be considered to be delivered where they're manufactured or where they were at the time of sale. So um, when you get there and um, you're told um, you can go to the back um, and, 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 and collect your, your, your goods, you, you cannot uh, refuse to do so um, and claim that the goods must follow you to your house unless you have an agreement that specifically um, entitles you to that provision. So you want to make sure that this is clear. And um, the other issue is where you would not uh, collect them from where they are, they can be collected from where they are manufactured. So you could have a scenario where you are purchasing, we're going towards the rainy season now, you're purchasing uh, green millies. If you're purchasing green millies from a farmer, Surely you don't expect him to deliver them to your office. You would, if, uh, uh, unless he has made that provision in the agreement. If not, you're going to his plot or you're going to her farm to collect those things from there. So you cannot say he or she is in breach of the contract by not delivering them in terms of the Consumer Protection Act. But why am I raising this for the business person? Uh, aside what the, um, the, the, the consumer may be thinking. Now you want to make sure you are going to protect yourself by being explicit. So when you are explicit, it becomes clear that even though the CPA says you have the obligation to deliver the goods, be explicit on the process. How are they going to be delivered and where are they going to be delivered? And you will notice that the particular provision even speaks to issues of agreed date and time. So as a supplier, you want to be sure you are not going to be in breach of the time term of the contract. This is a, a particular term of the contract. So once it's stated that you're going to deliver on this date, you better make sure you're going to deliver on that date because you'll be in breach. You'll be in breach of that contract. And then uh, B, goods to be delivered remain at the supplier's risk until the consumer has accepted delivery. So this is the other item that we want to look at, passage of risk. So the common law position has been that the risk uh, for the goods, as soon as the contract is perfected, 
it passes on to the consumer. So the CPA is basically extending the position or even uh, improving the position of the common law to say at no point does the risk pass to the consumer as long as the consumer has not received the goods or the goods have not been delivered to the consumer. So in the past, the only scenario whereby you would have um, the risk attaching to the, to the um, supplier would be uh, before the contract is perfected or that would be a scenario whereby there's a suspensive contract, term in the contract. What is a suspensive term? We said a suspensive term is a scenario whereby something must be done before the contract is finalized. So you could have a scenario whereby um, we're supposed to have uh, the goods delivered by the 31st of December. So before the 31st of December, the contract is not yet complete. It is still hanging in the air. So let's get, um, so what would happen is after the suspensive contract uh, event has um, come to pass, at that point, the risk passes on to the, to the um, consumer because the consumer is the one who has not uh, done his or her part. So the CPA seems to take that away. It says, as long as this thing remains in your possession, you still remain fully liable for it. You must still deliver it fit for purpose. You must deliver it without defects. You must deliver it without any form of harm or injury that can arise from it. And you must be ready to receive it back should it have any defects. So this is what would, uh, would then apply there. So in this case, it now remains your sole responsibility to ensure that these goods are kept safe. You are not negligent until you then go on to deliver them. And how does one deliver these goods? You want to make sure that you have absolved yourself of this uh, liability by proving acceptance or delivery. And for you to, to prove this acceptance of deli or, or delivery, it's, a, it's still in section uh, 21. Number one, you need an express communication from the supplier. I mean, from the customer that goods have been received. So express implied. Remember, express written. So the customer must sign that they have received the goods or at least have an implied uh, form of acceptance of those goods. How would you have an implied one? Uh, you, you could also talk to them uh, if you have any communication where they're making a follow-up on the, on the goods, then it's implied that the goods are now in their position. Um, that is how you can, you can prove it. But uh, telephonic conversations might not be the best. And then number two, you can wait for the seven days to expire. We covered these in the preceding video. The seven days will expire. Uh, after the seven days have expired, this is basically um, the period beyond which the, this particular person cannot come back. But even though, remember, they still have six months within which to come back if there are any defects. But should they want to come back and return the goods um, on grounds of failure to meet um, quality standards, they have uh, seven, uh, seven days within which to establish that this does not meet the quality standards in terms of Section 34. But otherwise, these persons, um, they, 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 they have uh, a right to bring them back should there be any defects. But as far as quality is concerned, the cutoff period is your seven days. The other item that, uh, the third item that I think the business person ought to be aware of, as far as the consumer law is concerned, is um, the unfair contract terms. This one is a little more detailed. And you'll find it in section 41. Uh, subsection one provides as follows. A transaction or agreement, a term or condition of a transaction or agreement or notice to which a term or condition is purportedly subject is unfair, unreasonable, or unjust if A, it is excessively one-sided in favor of any person other than the consumer. B, are so adverse to the consumer as to be inequitable. C, the consumer relied on a false misleading or deceptive representation to his or her detriment in terms of section 36. D, the transaction was subject to a notice referred to 
in section 43, subsection 1, and paragraph 1, the notice is unfair. 2, the notice was not drawn to the attention of the customer. Now, let us look at these terms and conditions that are provided here. You will notice that the first two are basically, A says it ought not to be one-sided and in favor of the other person other than the consumer. So this is an issue of fairness. What you're simply going to do is apply a scales. Let it be balanced 50-50. We cannot have a situation where it is significantly lopsided. So if we have a 60-40, is that um, significantly lopsided? 70-30, maybe I think it's too much. 80-20, definitely. And who then has the, the prerogative to decide? Whether this is fair or unfair, this is where now you go to the consumer protection officers. You go, I mean, the agents that will be looking or presiding over that. You can go to the magistrate's court. You can go to the high court, uh, depending on the jurisdiction of the claim and uh, the issue that you are, the term or condition that you are talking about. So, or even the commission, yes, the commission as well. So when you look at this, the first part is in the province of... Um, the officers, the judiciary to decide whether it is fair or unfair. Number two, where it is adverse to the consumer as to be inequitable. So when you look at the law of equity, this is where we're looking at number one, is it just, is it conscionable? You know, there are some things that are just, when you listen to them, it just, you know, makes, makes you wonder who in their right mind would... Uh, demand such a thing of another. So this is the law of equity, in other words. The law of equity looks at what is the conscionable thing to do? What is the just thing to do? So it, it, it might not be um, a, a precise to the dot kind of a, a juxtaposition. You got this, she got that, you got this, he got that. Therefore, this is the outcome. It, it might not be a scientific study, but basically on grounds of morality, it ought to be fair. It ought to be fair. It cannot be unfair. It cannot be unfair. Now, when you look at C, C is another interesting one. This is where the consumer relied on a false or misleading or deceptive representation to his or her detriment. So um, this detriment is in terms of Section 36. So when you look at uh, the detriment in terms of Section 36, what does it provide for? Number one, before we get there, the, the person must have relied on it. Number two, it must be to their detriment. So for you to rely on it, it must induce your entry into the contract. You cannot go into the contract and then come and sue for misrepresentation when you have already finalized the contract. Then you don't have relied on it. And secondly, you also need to prove what loss you have suffered. That is the detriment aspect. So when you're saying there's a detriment, let's show the setback. Show what you have lost, maybe an opportunity that you have lost because of this purchase. Show a financial commitment, an outlay that has resulted from this purchase and how it has affected you. So the last two are clear, they're straightforward. Now let us look at some of these things that can induce your entry into this contract. And you're going to find these in section 36, subsection 1, and in subsection 3. Now, let us start with subsection 1. It says, in relation to the marketing of goods or services, no supplier shall, by words or conduct. So, I, I want us to pause for a moment here. This uh, uh, provision already comes in a peremptory tone. This is a mandatory tone. It's a command tone. No supplier, first of all. So, how many of them can do it, Neil? Shall, that is another command. This is a no, 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 no. By words, verbal, conduct, implied. So you cannot do this. Number one, directly or indirectly, express or imply a false, misleading, or deceptive representation concerning a material fact to a consumer. So notice that the misrepresentation hinges on 
is the fact material. So it, it's not, it, it is not whether it has been implied, whether it was false, whether it was misleading or deceptive that matters the most. What matters the most is, is it material. If it is material, then what did it do? It must have tempered with decision making. Then we lack what we discussed in, um, in uh, part one. Consensus at idem. There is no meeting of the minds. This particular contract has been procured by deception. And it is a material misunderstanding. So how does this uh, come through? Then you, you come up with a mistake. So what would a mistake do? A, a, a mistake is going to render a contract void. Not voidable, void. Because the other person did not have a clear understanding of what was happening. And then it be, use exaggeration. I found this one interesting. Use exaggeration, insinuation, or ambiguity as to a material fact or fail to disclose a material fact if that failure amounts to a deception. Now, I think this is where the law is now stretching it. <laughs> so you, you cannot exaggerate. Number two, you cannot insinuate. Even though you have not said it with your, with your mouth, but you, you, it's an intonation, it's an innuendo to say, you know, things are actually like this when they are not like that. And it must still be a material fact. But here's the other thing that I found. You'll notice that um, the, the, the law it is designed ordinarily to deal with acts or, to, or to, to prescribe certain acts, to say, don't do this or do this. Now, here is an, an extension. Now, this is where now people are being penalized for inactivity. Why do I say so? Right? It, it, it goes on to say, fail to disclose a material fact if that failure amounts to deception. So what does the law do in this case? The law is now compelling people to act. So this is now um, a duty that is being imposed on, um, on the supplier. And should the supplier not correct a factual misunderstanding on the part of the consumer, even if the consumer brought it upon themselves, then in this case, this particular consumer would, uh, would find a leeway to say there is a misrepresentation here. Now let's uh, look at a scenario whereby, um, oh yeah, let, 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 let's just use uh, car parts, car parts. Someone uh, wants to, to buy a starter, starter, and uh, this starter is for uh, a Toyota Land Cruiser. And they walk into, let's say, it's a, a, a merchant of uh, Land Rover parts. You get there and the seller knows that the Land Rover starter and the Land Cruiser starter are not compatible. They know that. So the customer walks in and says, I need um, a Land Cruiser starter. Uh, sorry, a Land Rover starter, uh, a genuine Land Rover starter, I intend to install it on my Land Cruiser. And uh, I'm sure it's going to work. Now, if the supplier knows that a Land Rover starter does not work on a Land Cruiser, the fact that the supplier knows and does not correct the customer, this is a material fact not correcting the customer and selling that starter to them, in spite of the customer having convinced himself, you are then held liable for not correcting that. And, and I thought, yeah, yeah, maybe true if you put it that way. But did this person really rely on, on your silence? Or they'd already reconciled themselves to buying a Land Rover starter? So this is where now the, the, the law becomes a bit muddy because we're saying the person must have relied on the misrepresentation and they must have um, suffered a detriment. So how do you rely on a silence? 
You get to a shop, you're buying things that you should not be buying. The other person keeps quiet and just hands over what you want. Then you want to say they are guilty of misrepresentation by silence. I think we're stretching it. I think we're stretching it. Anyway, that's uh, something um, maybe that we can uh, look at in depth on, on another day. At C, fail to correct a misunderstanding by a consumer that amounts to a false, misleading or deceptive representation. We have already covered this. So the first one was fail to disclose a material fact. So this would be a scenario where um, a material fact would be like your pricing. But even when you come to see is fail to correct a misunderstanding by a consumer that amounts to a false, misleading or deceptive representation. So what, what suppliers basically become now are the, uh, the caretakers of all the customers. <laughs> That's what the CPA is doing. It's uh, forcing all suppliers to become caretakers, chaperones and patrons of all customers. Otherwise, they'll make wrong um, assumptions and misunderstand things. It is, your, it is all on you. It is all on you. And then uh, subsection three, subject to subsections one and two, it is false, misleading, or deceptive representation to state or imply or fail to correct a misunderstanding on the part of a customer to the effect that, we'll skip A, go to B, any goods or services, let's look at some paragraph one, have ingredients, performance characteristics, accessories, uses, benefits, qualities, sponsorship or approval. Now, haven't you heard people tell you this is the best? If you take this, you're going to be fine in two days. Performance characteristics. How many of us have bought things that we were told this one will work wonders for you and it did not? That was a misleading statement because we bought them for that particular um, uh, pitch to say, it is going to definitely give you this kind of performance. And it did not. And even on uh, ingredients, there are some people who will have gone out um, seeking natural honey and people have put in sugar in there and claimed that um, this was pure honey. Of course, that would be defective honey. Of course, you can always claim on the, others, or, or on the other one, as I mentioned. But this is a misleading aspect. You can always come through and, 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 take, it, and take them up on it. Okay, let's go to subparagraph two. Are of a particular standard, quality, grade, style, or model. So what we are looking at here is these are areas where people are ordinarily misled. So it becomes difficult for someone to, to advertise now. Even though we would say those are paths. Some of the claims that they make, their material, because how do you advertise? Uh, you're supposed to have a product labeling. In terms of your ingredients, that's true. You, you, you cannot claim that your product has things that it does not have. That was a straight mislead. But in terms of performance characteristics, uh, some, so, 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 some of those suppliers tend to milk it a bit there. So it, it is not going to be a scenario where you're going to get 100%. Um, what they actually claim, you know, some of us have bought things and, and, and you, you tend to realize later on, I, I was raped here. I, I didn't need to buy this. This, this was a rip off. So um, all in all, what, what we need to remember is that for you to claim a mislead, you must prove that it induced the entry into the contract and it resulted in your detriment. So if there is a term that is like that, it will ordinarily be covered by the unfair terms. Let's go to number three. The unfair notice, which is not drawn to the, to the attention of um, the customer. We did look at this uh, in our previous uh, video, section 43. Now you'll notice that section 41, 42, and 43 need to be covered together as you are going to go through your Consumer Protection Act, they need to be covered together. Why should they be covered together? Because you'll notice that um, Section 41 
actually proscribes transactions over unfair notices. It says you cannot have um, any transactions done that um, are unfair over an unfair condition. Do not have those. And then at section 42, you are now going to get um, the types of clauses that cannot be covered in a disclaimer. So should you wish to limit the, the rights of the consumer, you can do so, but there are certain uh, terms that are already identified as being unfair before you even limit them. So the moment you get to section 42, section 42, you're going to find that terms like no refund is unfair, no returns is unfair, no exchanges is unfair. So when you find that in 42, you simply go back to 40, 41. 41 says you are not going to transact business over an unfair condition. So the moment it is trapped in 42, it does not apply in 41. So you need to be looking at other notices, even though 42 is not exhaustive. You need to be looking at other clauses that you can put in there. And the reason is very simple. If you put in a blanket statement that is not qualified, that says no refund for no apparent reason after five days, that is a valid clause. Should I take that again? No refund. No refund after five days where you do not give a justifiable reason. Number two, no refund after seven days. Should you find that the quality does not meet the expected standard and you have, you have accepted delivery. After six months, no refund should you come and claim that there is a defect. After a repair, no refund when three months have expired. So that becomes a positive close because it is within the confines of the law. But when it is a blanket, no refund under any circumstances, then it becomes illegal. Even if you have pasted it and you have painted it in red throughout the whole um, store, you have painted it in red, no refund, no refund, no refund. It is still an illegality even if we agree that you are not going to refund. So a contract cannot be based on an illegality. I, I hope this makes sense. And so even in terms of no returns, section 34, so when you are going to look at no returns, it should be no returns in the context of section 34. So for your cooling off period, five days for those who are on contact, uh, seven days for those who are on um, uh, electronic, and, and others are going to apply there. So when we now get to section 43, section 43 can only apply to the other notices or closes that would not have been covered in section 42, and 41 going back because if you read section 43 to give you the authority to then go on and put a notice on your shop door that says no refund when you walked in you knew that i was not going to comply so you cannot force me to comply you're just chasing your tail in that case because what you are demanding is unlawful let me take that again when you put up an unlawful notice it does not become clothed with lawfulness because you have put it up as a notice. When you get people to sign for unlawful things, they do not become lawful because of a signature. Their signature does not clothe that with lawfulness. It does not. It still remains unlawful. All right. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure I've, uh, I've covered all those and uh, it's, it's now much clearer. So just to recap, on refunds and returns, these are supported. In section 11, the warranty of quality, those seven days. And section 12, warranty of repaired goods, that would be your, your three months and your six months on the other one. And uh, for cancellation of pre-orders, that can still be done. And, and you'll, be, you'll be compelled to refund, by the way. And uh, 25 and uh, 53, sections 25 and 53 will be the cooling uh, off period for your um, contact and your... Um, your um, electronic uh, transactions. But of course, logically, this will not apply to perishables and where it's against our public policy and 
health uh, concerns. Now, these terms are already implied. I, I mean, th th these terms are already taken out of the picture. All right, let me put it that way. They're taken out of the picture. You cannot have them in a contract. But the, the issue is we will not look at the ones that have been mentioned. We still want to be alive to the fact that the, ter the, 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 the terms that are, are supposed to be excluded, the, the principle is that they should not lean to one side more than the other if the other side which is losing is the customer. They should not adversely affect the customer. So the first two will generally trap everything else. So all these items that we have looked at, you will find that they will still fit into categories one and category two because they are still inequitable. They are still unfair. That's, that's what they are. And then uh, number four, statutorily imposed terms of contracts. So besides the unfair ones, the, the statute has already put in terms into the contract before you draft it. So whether you incorporate them or not, they are already there. So you must know this. We've already covered this. The warranty, the warranty in terms of qualities and uh, repaired goods. This is uh, in terms of section 11 and 12. And here is the other one that uh, is also inserted in there. The notice periods. Now, in the case of a fixed contract, which is uh, expiring and uh, subject to renewal, the customer is given, um, the, the, there is a condition that the customer has to give 20 days notice, right? And what is this um, notice for? It must be notice for termination of uh, the contract uh, before, before its natural expiry. You are supposed to be given 20 working days notice by the customer. All right. Now, this does not necessarily mean should they serve notice, their obligation to pay what is owing falls away. No, 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 no. It's a separate issue. They still pay whatever is owing. But now what, what I want you to notice is um, the interesting part is that on the other hand, the, the supplier, should they want to give notice of termination, the conditions or even give notice of a change in um, the terms and conditions of the contract, the supplier can give notice and this notice has a range. It should be no, not earlier than 80 days and not later than 40 days before the anticipated change. So what it, what it means is, um, let's say, just to get it uh, better. Let's just say you can give notice not earlier than three months of anything you want to change. But you cannot uh, give notice uh, later than one month before the change is effected. So what it means is um, 40 days will be about a month or so. And uh, 80 days this side is about three months or so. So this gives the, um, the, 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 the customer uh, three months to plan for a change and not less than a month to plan for a change. This is more than adequate room. But when you come to the customer, the customer is being given 20 days to give you that notice. And that 20 days will be about, um, about um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 days of about a month because 20, 20 working days, 22 working days is a month. So if we're looking at 40 working days, actually, 40 working days translates to two months. Yeah, come to think of it. 40 working days translates to about two months. So you cannot give notice that is less than two months for a change on a consumer agreement. And so if we are looking at um, 80 days, that will give us about uh, four months. So not only four to two months, that is your range in essence. You can operate in there for any changes. So what does this really mean for the business person? How often do things change in the retail industry? So often. Now this denies you responsiveness, in other words. What it means is that you can only project and respond after two months. 
Is the economy, the Zimbabwean economy, that stable? Let us, let us just be frank. Is it that stable? Can you say, whatever I plan today, I will affect two months from now? Is this realistic? Are, are we not um, frustrating businesses? How are they going to cope when we come up with such conditions? So this, this is, this is uh, where we are. And then um, the other one that you're going to find is the supplier can only terminate a contract after giving uh, 20 days notice to the customer to regularize the breach of contract. So this is something that, uh, so if it is not cured in 20 working days, which is a month's notice, ordinarily you would have had notice of 10 days or so, 10 working days. But now to make it 20 days, and uh, this person has all the time to sort out whatever the issues could have been. So I, 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 I thought um, it, it would be helpful for us to look at this as we go into the consumer agreements so that um, as a business person you are, you want to be alive to these terms and conditions of your contract. Let's look at item number five on liability. Now, uh, the Consumer Protection Act seems to ensure the consumer um, against liability uh, and it is in the similar fashion of uh, Section 24 of uh, COBIA 2019. Uh, this was uh, what we covered, the Taquan rule uh, in the engine case and uh, the Kundishwara and Red Cross case. Um, you, you remember there was the part about um, uh, the consumer's right to, oh, sorry, the, M, the, 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 the client's right, yeah, because this was not labor. It's a business law. I'm getting tripped in, my, in, in too many acts now. Now, COBIA 24, Section 24, basically says the, the client has the right to assume regularity. That, that, that's a given. You, you assume things are regular, that they've been done according to the book. You cannot make the assumption that uh, he or she would know when they have no access to these things. So now when you come to Section 38, Section 38 is basically a copycat of the same. And I want to just draw the comparisons. Now it's going to be easier for you to, to draw the comparisons. Let's have a look at Section 38. Consumers try to assume supplier is entitled to sell or supply goods or services. Subsection 1. Subject to subsection 2, a consumer has a right to assume that A. In the case of a supply of goods or services, the supplier has the legal right or authority of the legal owner to supply those goods or services. B. In the case of an agreement to supply goods or services, the supplier has a legal right or authority to Subparagraph so 1, sell the goods or services at the time the title to those goods is to pass to the consumer. 2. List the goods or services at the time. The list is to take possession of the list goods or services. Or C. The supplier is liable for any charge or encumbrance pertaining to the goods or services in favor of a consumer. Unless 1. Such a charge or encumbrance is disclosed in writing to the consumer before the transaction or agreement is concluded. Two, the supplier or consumer have colluded to defraud the producer. So let us look at, let us just end where we are there at number two and work our way back. At number two, the supplier and consumer have colluded to defraud the producer. So what would happen, a, a collusion in this case, to carry out an unlawful act is going to uh, undo the whole process. But where there is no collusion, this particular assumption stands vindicated. And what is this assumption? That whoever is selling is actually authorized to do so. I cannot uh, go about saying, have you done everything according to the book? So when anyone comes over and they're supposed to do this for me, I have the right as a consumer to assume that the due process has been done. I do not have an obligation to inspect. The only time I'm going to be at fault is if I am party to the process of seeking to connive and defraud 
a third party. So this is a sort of um, the assumption of regularity that we looked at in section 24 in the COPIA 20, 2019 Act. So this is, this is something I thought it was going to strike you as interesting as you draw these uh, similarities. Now, there is the other part. Let's leave the part about uh, the, the customer. I just decided to discuss this here instead of in, 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 in the last uh, video because I thought, let me just put liability on the same section. But otherwise, that is a right of the customer, the right to make assumptions. They are protected at law for the assumptions they make. Now, let's look at section 16. Listen to what it says. Liability for damage caused by goods. And we want to look at subsection 2. Except as contemplated in subsection 5, the producer, importer, distributor, or retailer of any goods is liable for any harm as described in subsection 4, caused wholly or partly as a consequence of A, supplying unsafe goods, or B, a product failure, defect, or hazard in any goods. C, inadequate instructions or warnings provided to the consumer. Four, if in a particular case, more than one person is liable in terms of this section, their liability is joined and several. Five, liability of a particular person in terms of this section does not arise if A, the unsafe product characteristic failure defect is wholly attributable with compliance with a public regulation. B, it did not exist at the time of the supply. And the customer did not comply with instructions. And lastly, it is unreasonable to expect the distributor or retailer to have discovered the unsafe product characteristic failure, defect or hazard having regard to the person's role in marketing the goods to the consumer. Now, I want us to just briefly look at uh, the liability here. First of all, I want to explain this term, joint and severally liable. You're going to find this later on when you look at vicarious liability. Let me just explain it here so that when we meet it, it becomes clearer. What it means is that should uh, a legal process ensue, when a legal process has taken off, whatever determination shall come in terms of damages, that particular outcome, damages are going to be claimed from one of those parties, not all of them, one. So all you need to do is just catch the biggest fish, the one that cannot uh, escape the net, catch that one. What you do is you claim all the damages from that one. That one whom you claim from, what is he or she going to do? They are then going to go on and claim from their other parties who have been cited in that particular case. So they're supposed to share that proportionally. So who are the parties that are implicated here? They are already listed. And the parties are number one, the one who is supplying the goods. Number two, the distributor of the goods. Number three, the importer of the goods if they're coming from without. Number five, the producer of the goods. So if you import goods and uh, there is the part about your duty of disclosure and then you pass yourself as the producer and you stick on your labor onto that, when you do so, you become the producer and you shall be fully responsible for any defect or harm that can arise from that product. Why am I saying this? Why am I raising this? I know most of us, we are planning to go into entrepreneurship, but we do not have the means of producing these goods. So what we do, we go and um, get our own um, containers that are already branded. We get other people's products. We empty them into our containers and we sell. Or we repackage whatever we're getting from, from other people and we pass it on. When you do so, you have passed yourself through as a producer. You are going to become fully liable for whatever you pass out if it causes any risk or harm. So you, you cannot escape from that. The only part where you can escape as a distributor or as a retailer, it is where you can prove that there is no way I could have known what the contents were like. So let's look at um, your um, 
your maheu, right? I, 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 don't, I don't want to use other beverages. Your maheu container, you cannot inspect the contents because it's, um, it, it's not transparent. So all you can do is check if it is sealed. So when the retail, retailer passes that thing on to you, it has been produced by uh, RML or it has been produced by Dairy Board. And you, while you're consuming it, you, dis, you, you realize that they, they, there is some defect in it. Some uh, foreign object has been dropped in there, which should not have been there, ranging from many other objects that have been found, especially by those who drink beer. So when that happens, this particular person cannot bring a claim against the, the, retail, the, the retailer in terms of item number five. Because the one who is the retailer cannot be expected to have reasonably known what was inside a sealed container. So they are exempt. But the producer, the one who sealed the container, cannot escape liability. So the liability is going to attach to whosoever else could have had access to it. And the same applies for service providers. Well, let's say you're looking at um, installation of uh, DSTVs and things like that. So if, if someone is a certified installer and they install things that are not working, you don't necessarily have to return them from, to the producer. You return to the supplier. The supplier will claim from the producer. Your agreement is with the supplier. So your point of contact is the supplier. So let the supplier deal with his or her producer. That's how they become jointly and severably liable. So that's how it works. But um, even in terms of uh, putting on stickers, onto goods that you have not produced, that is a misrepresentation, by the way, and it is a material fact. Because when you actually, the, the law demands that you must uh, publish information as to where goods are coming from, their ingredients, their quality, their performance characteristics. So when you, you know, um, I'm sure you've heard about people who used in the past, uh, when uh, flat screens came into uh, they became more popular. What they did was they, 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 they got whatever brand they had and they brought stickers and they would just stick them onto their brands. And uh, you know what? Once you put in that sticker, it appreciates in value. And people were forced to buy things that did not last because they were passed off as the genuine uh, when it was just fake. So that would be something that you can be liable for misrepresentation before you even go to... Um, the project quality or, or on its delivery because you'd have been um, you'd have relied on uh, that conduct even though they didn't say it with their words by conduct they have told you this is a samsung they have told you this is a jvc they have told you this is a kenwood so when you are purchasing you're looking at the brand that they have stuck there and yet that is not the right thing so in in that particular case these people become fully liable now, let's look at section 81 on vicarious liability. I remember we, we had a discussion, 2021 class, second semester. Um, there was the, the Doves case that we looked at where an employee is uh, alleged to have uh, swapped cops, copses and ended up having uh, an empty casket being, being interred and stuff like that. So when you look at uh, section 81, section 81 would cover those kind of scenarios where an employee has messed up. The, the company has nothing to do with it. It is purely the employee. When such a thing happens, go to section 81. You need to know this. If an employee or agent of a supplier of goods or services is liable in terms of this act for anything done or omitted in the course of that person's employment or activities on behalf of their principal, the employer or principal, is jointly and severally liable with the employee or agent. So let us look at that. We have already established what it means to be jointly and severally, severally liable. So what the, the court would do, I mean the, 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 the counsel would do, the, the opposing lawyer, the, the, the lawyer is going to cite the employee who did the thing and they're going to cite the employer in the same papers. And they are not going to make the case about the employee, I mean the employer, or about the supplier. They are going to make the case about the conduct of the employee. And say, now, at the end, there is what is known as a prayer. And then at the end, they will pray 
that damages of so much be uh, awarded for the plaintiff or the complainant, whatever the case may be. So when they have that prayer offered and the prayer has been granted, what they then do, they now go to the employer and say, employer, pay the damages. The employer is going to start quibbling and what, 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 what. You know what they will do? They go to the deputy sheriff. The deputy sheriff is going to come to the company and attach company property. So if the employer wants to recover, the employer can only recover from the employee. But how then is the employer going to recover from the employee? All that the employer can do is just fire the employee because they will not be in a position to go and attach his uh, property from home. Most probably he's um, a good-for-nothing fella. So ch ch chances are he cannot pay the damages anyway. So the only recourse they have is to part ways with you because you are um, a serious cost to them. You have um, cost the money. And um, the other thing, uh, before we leave liability, what I'm noticing here, I'm still on the line of thought that the CPA, in trying to, to balance and level the playing field, the CPA seems to have gone too far. Let me uh, qualify, qualify um, my, 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 my position. I've, I've looked at the Labor Act. I've looked at the um, Companies Act. If you look at um, the, the punishment, let me put it that way, um, the deterrence that are in those acts, you're going to find that they usually sound more in fines. But when you come to the CPA, they seem to sound both in fines and imprisonment. You'll get a bit of imprisonment in the Labor Act, but it is not as pronounced. When I, I, I looked at the CPA, I noticed that there are about 12 inst instances. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to cover the ones that relate to officers or of the commission having their own issues that they have to deal with. But if you look at the ones that are just cited in the CPA, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. Section 26, the one that talks about pricing, you need to put stickers, you need to honor the prices. It must be in the currency that is uh, trading in Zimbabwe. If you flound that, if you violate that section, you could be imprisoned for three months. So this is the criminalization of a civil process. So a civil process would ordinarily be visited with a fine, would ordinarily want to say, let us, um, you remember that part, let us take the parties back to where they were before the contract. When the contract is void, re vindicatio, take them back. A red hippishin. Let us take them back to where they were. And if it is voidable, you may want to say, well, up to this point, it applied, but going forward, it is now nullified. So these are some of the things that we're looking at. But when you come here, you're going to notice that it is all heavy-handed on the supplier. You're going to find many suppliers being um, incarcerated and jailed because of this. So it, it sort of speaks to the attitude and the tone of uh, the, 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 the lawmaker. The lawmaker is coming with a heavy hand to make sure that they procure compliance out of uh, the, um, the supplier. So when you go back to part one, when you looked at um, the likes of Austin, who argued, uh, even Maduku does make the same claims, that the law is actually commands backed by threats. So the, the, the level of threats that you find in the CPA are just too loud. They're just too loud. As if that is not enough. Section 36 on misrepresentations, the ones we've just looked at about, looked at, and 54 on unsolicited communications, advertising, unsolicited advertising, and section 30, 75, hindering, obstructing an investigator or an inspector from carrying out their, their work in the, in, in, in the retail sector. That would attract an imprisonment of six months. Six months. We're moving up. Section 31. If you do not label your products correctly and you even tamper with uh, the labeling, one full year, one full year in prison. Number four, you could go up to two years. And this would be section 13.4. What has this got to do with exposing people to risks and you have not taken the notices and where you're supposed to give them original copies where they have um, 
and there is a, there's a disclaimer and they've taken the risk upon themselves, you can go in for two years for, the, for, for not doing that. And uh, number five, disclosing uh, private property, I mean, listen to me, private information, not pro property. Disclosing private information that relates to someone. Uh, look at a scenario whereby you, when you fill in data for your mobile line, you have lots of private information that you put in there. Someone can actually go in there, just extract your data, extract your information from there. Should the supplier do that, whoever does so, you go to prison for two years. And then section 79, we're looking at pagery or even contempt of court or commission. Pagery is lying during a court process and a contempt will be refusing to abide by a um, lawful order that has been issued through a legal process. Should you refuse to do so, two years in prison. And this one is the highest and it got me shocked. Section 42, you can go up to five good years of imprisonment when you violate a disclaimer clause. The ones about um, where you should not um, put in a, a notice that says um, no refund, uh, no exchange, you know, and things like that. If you violate that one, you're going in for five years. Now, when you look at um, these uh, provisions, you want to say at the end of the day, is this not an overkill? Is this not too much? Surely. Are we not really going too far with the CPA? Has the CPA not um, actually started another imbalance? So as we conclude, we want to look at um, these issues and say, the, the terrain is not leveled here. The terrain is actually a slippery slope for, for the business person. So it is now incumbent upon the business person to make sure they are acquainted with these provisions. We have not covered them exhaustively. Remember, this course is about the principles. Once you have the principles, you know what to go looking for. You're going to be covering this, I'm sure, when you get into your marketing courses. That's where you're going to cover this in detail. But for now, let this be adequate for you to keep your, your eyes wide open and do the rightful and the needful. Before we roll over into company law, why don't we spend a moment in prayer and uh, ask for a blessing upon each and every one of us. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of considering consumer law. And dear Lord, we are even consumers of the products of heaven. They are blessings. They are given unto us free and at no cost. For they are new every morning. As we come to the end of this discourse, may you remind us to look unto you who is the fairest of all suppliers and give us gratitude in our hearts. For we are the consumers of the year. Be with us till we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen.